and welcome to the farm. Steve Snyder and Frank Zero joining you for this particular episode. Greg and Dana Newkirk's recently released documentary, Hellier, manages to connect a vast number of somewhat explored rabbit holes spanning ufology and the occult. Since it is one of the first works to not just bring up, but entirely fuse these ideas into one place, it certainly caught our interest. Before we have Alan Greenfield and Paul Weston on our show, we wanted to discuss some of our own findings. I've long been curious about the possible and quite significant links between UFOs and aliens and magic, and this documentary has served as a gateway to these understandings, whether they be ancient, top secret, are simply stitched into the silence that surrounds secret societies and their highest priority level of secrecy. The two seasons of the show bring up everything from tonal invocations via a kind of celestial or consciousness music all the way to dumbs or deep underground military bases. One of the themes in the documentary is the idea of the 37th parallel that runs across the U.S. Focusing in on this ley line effectively connects the Pentagon Fort Knox, Washington, D.C., Kentucky's Mammoth Cave System, National Park, which seems to be the home of goblins or greys or both, central to the Hellier's investigation. New Mexico's Dulce Base, located under the Arcoleta Mesa, where Phil Schneider allegedly accidentally stumbled into a firefight between special forces and the greys underground after taking an elevator to the wrong floor. Colorado's Mesa Verde, the Four Corners, where Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico meet, the site of the Aztec 1948 UFO crash, an event largely overshadowed by the more pop-culturally palpable Roswell crash, Death Valley, which serves as Nevada's Area 51, the Grand Canyon, Utah's Moab and Canyonlands National Park. Outside of the U.S., the line extends through Granada, Fukushima, and the very border of North and South Korea. Another huge concept I've tried to stay as informed as possible on is mega rituals, as we began calling them in the sync community, or hyper sigils, which were cast knowingly from a pop culture level of consciousness. Some of these include invisibles and the accompanying accompanying lecture Grant Morrison gave at the disinformation convention years back. Staying with comics, Alan Moore's Prometheus, And his real-world run-in with his character, John Constantine, is another great example. For those who don't know, uh, Alan Moore was in a bar one day and claims that John Constantine walked up to him and asked him to follow him outside to some unknown path, uh, some unknown fate, which Alan Moore turned down for his own reasons. Moving into music, Tool and Alex Gray's ritualized release of Lateralis, and the Mars Volta's Bedlam in Goliath, as well as live Scab Dates album. The accompanying occult experiments the Mars Volta did making this music are great examples in the music world, and I believe this is the first to suggest a documentary has the same power. As we began investigating some of this phenomenon on our own, we found ourselves promptly thrown into a tsunami of personal sync and occult significance, some of which we'll be exploring and attempting to further illuminate in many episodes to come. I've been able to draw a few parallels, so to speak, to the work of Richard Shaver and older Amazing Stories material, published originally by Ray Palmer. Uh, Stephen, what do you think of the creatures who seem to escort humans into the underworld, into the hell uh, land of, of Hellier in older literature and do you think there is there a way to know if they're the same as the goblins that um that come up in the first couple of episodes that the man was experiencing in his backyard and surrounding property uh or even the darrows from richard shaver's book well i mean obviously when you sort of get back to more uh ancient you know references to this i mean you almost inevitably come to the fae the fairy folk uh elves that type of thing who are often commonly associated with uh underworlds and so on and so forth and then of course you have even the older traditions um with persephone and so forth the kind of descent into the underworld and so on and so forth and um Certainly, in that regard, too, I think there is a risk sometimes of getting too literal when we start talking about, you know, beings in the underground and so on. I think that to some extent this might even be uh, 
as much of a psychological thing as anything, uh, a kind of form of initiation, which uh, the underworld is kind of symbolic, if you will, of kind of a descent into the darkness to confront the shadow and that type of thing. So certainly it does, uh, you know, jive very closely with some very primordial fears uh, that humans, I think, have long possessed. And, you know, in kind of a fictional account of this, uh, I can almost kind of think of The Empire Strikes Back, the second Star Wars, or what was the second Star Wars movie in the original trilogy. I think now it would be the fifth or something to that effect. But uh, kind of the great scene when Luke goes into the cave uh, when he'd been training with Yoda, and uh, in there he's confronted with Vader. Uh, kind of has a freak uh, moment there with him and so on. But, um, you know, this is something that's been with us for a very long time. And in terms of the parallels, at least, with Hellier and getting back to the Fae, uh, obviously there's the Scots-Irish connection, the fact that you had so much of the fairy faith that was prevalent in Scotland and Ireland, and so many of the individuals had immigrated to the United States from that region of the country and had ended up in... Uh, Kentucky and West Virginia and the whole Appalachian region and so forth. And it is certainly uh, a bit ironic, to put it mildly, that you would have such similar beliefs that would appear amongst the Native Americans in terms of also having their own traditions of subterranean beings and so forth. And also with the Scots-Irish coming over. And then, of course, you have the prevalence of the mounds in both regions of the country as well. Uh, you know, these were a lot of times seen is entrances to the underworld where you would descend into them. Uh, in the case of the Andina and the Hopewell, these were probably ritual centers as well, which is where I kind of get into the, you know, earlier the psychological aspect of all of this, whether or not, you know, there was an actual descent into the underworld or whether this was just something that was happening mentally is certainly open for debate, but uh, it does make for some interesting discussion to put it mildly. <laughs> certainly. I um, They even mention in the Hellier series, how it kind of refers to um, Joseph Campbell's uh, one of the integral parts of the hero's journey to go underground and go through this necessary initiation. There's an association as well with uh, what could be called mystery schools or just ancient cultures, different forms of initiation, making it necessary to go underground. And then there's more modern tales of people with no knowledge or desire to be initiated who just out of curiosity wander into the literal <laughs> underworld and have some sort of similar experience. And I find that interesting about the paranormal and occult in general. You can um, use all the trappings of ritual and uh, ancient custom and tradition to to force yourself through a sort of initiation or you can do this practice in a, in a group as with organized magic or you can just be some paranormal investigator or some you know backyard hick wandering out of your own curiosity and still have a very similar experience i used to often think how we think of the layers of the brain and we have at the base of course this reptilian brain left over from so many thousands of years ago and how when you view the earth's layers and crust and its underground worlds in a similar way you have the same sort of demonic uh sort of uh reptilian i guess idea when you start to get into conspiracy theories about uh dumbs or the deep underground military bases that i mentioned it's like the scariest parts of our imagination and our psyche uh, may actually mirror physical beings uh, that are out there. Certainly in the ancient traditions, you would want the initiate to come face to face with this kind of fear, recognize it as part of themselves, as part of the human equation, and make it out into the light uh, the, the next day and, and, and come back that much more whole and that much more connected to a kind of truth. And then at the same time, it seems we have uh, testimony or alleged stories of people like Phil Schneider, who quite literally accidentally hit the wrong elevator floor going to, he was an engineer, and he wound up on a floor that he really wasn't supposed to be going to, accompanied by, I think, a single uh, Black Beret Special Forces um, security soldier of some kind who wound up dying in this experience. And he obviously had no spiritual impetus to accidentally go to the wrong floor, but wound up having a 
firefight with the greys or whatever. It doesn't really connect to the reptilians, but I think it's interesting to make that parallel between the way the brain is layered and the way the earth seems to be layered. Um, whether those telurgic lines, ley lines, or dragon lines uh, connect to our brain or our consciousness in some way um, seems obvious, but as, as to the actual um, technical explanation, I think we're still at a loss to connect all these ideas in any way. Um, I think it's interesting how the Darrow come out in Richard Shaver's stories and stories around Mount Shasta, but then you have this idea, like you were speaking of, with the serpent mounds and certain traditions with Native Americans that very much mirror parts of Scotland and Ireland and the UK, where similar beings um, have similar powers, similar motivations, and also live in some kind of underground realm, the uh, entrance of which was is still marked to this day by megalithic sites and things like that. Um, there's so many ideas at play in Hellier. It's honestly uh, hard to discuss any part of it without going in a bunch of different directions and sort of getting lost. But I do see enough resemblance between the different initiations, or at least the beings, where they come from, and how to contact them throughout human history for it to be significant enough to be looked at a lot more closely um, instead of just thrown in with paranormal new agey thought you know the associated with mental illness mental illness is also also a foot in hellier because in uh, somerset and these areas where they're traveling they wind up learning from the local police that there is an anomalous amount of mental illness in the area and it's even kind of proposed that the same thing is around Sedona, Arizona uh, being some sort of crystalline structure under the ground some of which even juts out into the surface world or whatever and somehow that crystalline structure these minerals or whatever affect our consciousness or our brain chemistry in some way um, to lead multiple people to profess seeing the same kinds of lights or beings and I suppose other people to just kind of uh, go off into any schizophrenic direction of, of a broken mind. Um, I just wanted to mention real quick that uh, at some juncture in season two, uh, episode 10, Dana says the entrance to the cave doesn't even look real. It looks like a movie set. And according to Terry Rist, uh, in the interview with Alan Greenfield, this entrance can actually be spotted in the film Deliverance, in one of the raft scenes where they're just kind of quickly going by these different cave systems in that in that river, I suppose. Um, so what is, is there any significance to certain numbers that Greg and Dana keep coming across in uh, Hell Year? Well, yes, I mean, it, it's the whole show, and that was one of the aspects that was most interesting to me, is it's really a bonanza for, uh, you know, numbers with various kinds of occult significance and so on and so forth. And they do address uh, some of them in the show, but one or two, I should say, specifically that were kind of glaring to me that really didn't get a lot of play were the numbers 17 and 23. And, um, of course, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with the so-called 23 Enigma, but it's not well known that originally the 23 Enigma was known as the 17-23 phenomena, and this was something that had been coined by uh, Robert Anton Wilson initially in the Illuminatus trilogy, and then which he later expanded on in the first volume of the Cosmic Trigger uh, series that he would later publish, and uh, Wilson actually credited to... Um, William S. Burroughs, the famous beat writer who had written Naked Lunch and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of curious uh, similarities with these numbers. And uh, as far as I can tell, one of the oldest connections that they had uh, was related to the Roman holiday, uh, the Saturnina, which is partly what our modern Christmas festival is based upon. The Saturnalia started on the 17th of December and uh, continued to the 23rd of December. And it was characterized by a very carnival-like atmosphere, a lot of debauchery and so forth. Um, of course, uh, uh, I know Frank's aware of this. Some of the readers who have been with me for a long time might be aware of this, but my uh, birthday was actually on, is actually on December 17th. So uh, that's one of the reasons why 17 has always 
held a great degree of fascination to me. And certainly when I learned about uh, the phenomenon of 17 and 23, it's something that I've generally chronicled, you know, throughout my life uh, for years now. And certainly a lot of pivotal events have happened to me on the 17th or 23rd of uh, different months and so forth, often uh, quite bad ones. But uh, it is certainly two numbers that are associated to some extent with tragedy. Um, in terms of 17, uh, there was some older occult significance that was related to Osiris, which uh, Osiris is also seen as one of the personifications of the green man. So if you are familiar with the Hell Your TV show, there is a lot of discussion in there about the green man. But uh, Osiris was said to have been murdered on the 17th day of Aster, Aster I believe, uh, was the name of the month. Um and in the Egyptian calendar, this would, or in the uh, modern calendar, this would have translated to November 13th, which um, ironically was actually uh, the day that my father was born on. Uh, <clears throat> also, according to uh, Fraser in uh, The Golden Bow, uh, a sacrificial victim would have been selected a few days later on what would have been November 17th for the Saturnalia. And uh, there also seems to be some references to this in biblical accounts as well. Of course, uh, there's been some speculation that the figure of Lazarus was a stand-in for Osiris in the New Testament. And uh, in John 12, 17, this was the exact passage where uh, Jesus had resurrected Lazarus from the dead, similar to the resurrection that Osiris goes through. So you've had this kind of long-standing association with 17 and death and rebirth, which certainly seems to be quite significant in terms of Hellier. And uh, there were several noteworthy 17s that showed up, uh, of course, especially in relation to Ashland, Kentucky. They finished the investigation to that on December 17th, my birthday. Uh, the street originally, which I believe they thought that the wagon wheel was based off of... Um, which is where uh, Terry Ristic claimed to have, or near where Terry Ristic claimed to have found injured cold back in the 70s, it was uh, at the corner of two streets, 17th Street, I think, and uh, one, two, three, something or other. So you've got your 17, your 23 there. Uh, and then in the kind of mysterious, uh, one of the mysterious emails, the figure of Amy sends to Greg. Uh, she mentions this cabin where she thought that she had heard a woman being horribly tortured at and essentially had said that she had been aware of the cabin for years but had never thought much of it and uh, specifically she said she had been aware of it for at least 17 years. Uh, I believe there was also a 23 that showed up in one of the hotel rooms that they were staying in in Ashland. So, yeah, there are some very strange occurrences of 17 and 23 in the show, which doesn't really get expounded upon by the filmmakers. Um, obviously, the, there was a lot to cover. I don't know if it was just a case that they weren't aware of it or something to that effect, but uh, it is quite interesting, and certainly given the connections that 17 and 23 over the years have had, uh, I think probably quite significant to a broader understanding of the show, and certainly if you've seen it, you do know that numerology comes up a lot throughout the series, so quite possibly they just had not really had a chance to digest everything associated with that. Um, and I was going to say, too, kind of getting back to the subterranean caverns and whatnot, another uh, interesting connection with Hellier, that is the god Pan. Of course, Pan does become quite significant as the show goes along. Pan was kind of seen also as potentially being one of the inspirations for the Green Man, and Pan was himself often worshipped in caves as well. Uh, some of the oldest cults really went back to the worship of Pan and these kind of subterranean lairs and whatnot. So you've had this tradition, this descent into the underworld for a very, very long time uh, that really, you know, in a way almost seems to, uh, to uh, being reborn with the Hellier series in this current era of ours, which is really, again, quite fascinating in and of itself. Surely. Um, yeah, I found a lot of the... What I was mentioning kind of in the intro is how quickly uh, we were all drawn into the synchronicities uh, as we began our own investigation and and individual watchings of, of Hellier. And I have a friend who I'm just going to change his name uh, to protect his privacy quickly, but let's say his name is Bravo. And he, I was talking to him while I was investigating, watching the rest of Hellier. And so Bravo mentions um, ashes within his home. Uh, he texted me that 10 minutes 
after I was sitting there pondering the purpose of this, the symbolism of ashes when talking about ash land. As you just mentioned, uh, your birthday was the first day of investigation in the documentary. It starts on December 17th, but <clears throat> right after they say that it's December uh, 17th, yes? Uh, actually, I think it was the last day of the investigation was December 17th when they were kind of wrapping it up and going their concluding, uh, concluding thoughts. Oh, okay. You're, you're certainly right, because it was in the second season. Uh, I misspoke there. But yet, yeah, it was wrapped up on December 17th, and then right after they kind of flashed that on the screen, they put together all the clues of this map of Ashland, and all the significant places on the map form an exact mirror of my zodiac sign, uh, if you're just mapping the stars out individually, of cancer, but I woke up the next morning uh, with Chelsea Wolfe's American Darkness in my head, and that music video was released on uh, my birthday, but of 2019, July 16th. So that's what I kind of meant in the intro by, uh, we were kind of personally pulled in by all sorts of details. That's not the extent of it, and I don't want to boggle you guys down with um, what you could call personal sinks, but it seems like this thing whatever this is going on with this hellier phenomenon, uh, pulls you in personally besides your own novel interest in the topics. Um, let's see. So besides the significant numbers, we have these significant names that keep coming up. Uh, they mention Pike and Parsons, and Crowley would certainly... Um, along those lines. Was there anything you wanted to say about these these power names or Parsons particularly? Well, yeah, it's definitely, to me, very interesting that uh, Parsons shows up uh, at a few points in the second season. Of course, the uh, initial appearance uh, relates back to their attempts to figure out who owned a certain residence in Hellier, Kentucky uh, that they were searching for in the first season. Uh, Greg and Dana had originally gone to Hellier, I believe, a few years before the first season it really you know got going in terms of uh editing it together and whatnot and they had seen a house there that they thought would be a good candidate for the residency of the individual who had kind of started this whole thing greg had gotten an email from a guy named david christie and uh what was it i think 2012 maybe a little before that or something but um had told him about how he had been seeing goblins and his granddaughter was terrified and so on and so forth and uh greg and dana had eventually gone to hellier to see if they could track down this david christie they couldn't find any evidence of him but they had seen a house that seemed to fit the description of the residence that he was living in um but then when they had gone back with the rest of the team, and I think it was 2017, they could not find it. Uh, so after, you know, doing some Google searches and I think maybe pulling some things off the old footage, uh, with slow cap and whatnot, they were able to determine uh, the house where it was located. And it turned out that the house was named by, or was uh, owned at some point by a guy named David. But instead of his last name being Christie, it was David Parsons. Um, later they were able to track down David Parsons' uh, Facebook page and came to a conclusion that this was not the same David who had emailed them. But it was still interesting, and then they would show, they would find some other additional references to Parsons throughout the second season, most notably in Ashland. Uh, I think like one of the Hall of Records or a library or something they had gone to was named Parsons. And um, for those of you who you know, have followed Alistair Crowley and uh, some of his accolades and what have you. Of course, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, was Jack Parsons, the um, rocket scientist who had invented the rocket fuel that effectively took us to the moon. He blew himself up in 19, what was it, 52, 53, somewhere thereabouts. But um, <clears throat> certainly there's kind of a whole cult of personality around Jack Parsons himself. So, and given the fact that so much of Crowley's system kind of lingers over hell you're like a specter uh, even though it's not really directly addressed very often but they do depend quite heavily on uh the cipher system that alan greenfield had developed and greenfield's system in turn was completely based upon crowley and the book of the law and all this type of thing so in that sense at least it was very interesting to me that they did encounter so many of these parsons references and then on top of that um 
Jack Parsons had, of course, famously performed the Babylon working with um, L. Ron Hubbard, the eventual founder of Scientology. And Parsons had become convinced that this uh, event specifically is what had ushered in the modern UFO era as well. So that kind of plays into the whole curiosity, I think, that they have in regards to UFOs throughout the hell year, both seasons, and whether or not there was some kind of extraterrestrial element to it. Uh, and that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, the appearance of Parsons kind of puts it into this sort of camp, uh, this Crowleyan camp uh, that really, you know, is prevalent throughout the entire show, even though it's not implicitly addressed in a lot of cases. Surely. Uh, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, Parsons developed the rocket fuel that got us to the moon. One could argue that the combination of the rocket fuel and the rocket the V2 developed by Werner von Braun really got us into the era of space travel if we're not talking in any occult terms but Parsons was I mean the Babylon working he's working with these uh, ritual systems that supposedly will put him in contact with um, or open a doorway to extraterrestrials or ultra terrestrials and Werner von Braun is a much more technical figure uh, as he's popularly known in history but all of the blueprints for the flying saucers that were built by the Third Reich were a, a conjunction of the occult downloads <clears throat> from Maria Orsic of the Vril Society and von Braun's um, you know, technical know-how. Later, uh, Parsons wouldn't be around, but von Braun would be asked, how did he make that leap to get us to the moon? How did he make that giant technological leap to make us a space-bound race? And he and Hermann Oberth and um, Victor Schauberger all kind of agreed and, and said that the information came from up there they were referred to it coming from quote unquote them and they pointed to the sky as if to directly reference aliens so any way you want to look at it uh, everything from the v2 to nazi flying saucers all the way to parsons and hubbard's magic was deeply connected with and interested in the alien part of the equation um then i just i find that really interesting of course crowley would be the first person to bring us a kind of pop culture representation of a gray alien. So we go from these ancient depictions of big headed, uh, weird eyed gray alien looking creatures on cave walls and things. I mean, ancient, ancient art. Um, and then we, we kind of skip a few hundred or thousand years. And then all of a sudden we have Crowley, um, contacting lamb and drawing this gray alien who we believe to have some, Tibetan Lama sort of resonance. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so one of the more extreme parts, uh, one of the more cryptic ideas throughout Hellier is it, are Greg and Dana being led into sort of filming and producing a, a hyper sigil or a mega ritual that will affect pop culture and get people interested in these ideas are they kind of being led by people who understand their curiosity and their novel interest to produce something else that will affect the consciousness of the rest of us and the two most extreme parts of this narrative are the man they couldn't track down that you had explained uh originally went by uh, the name christy and this girl amy who's sending them emails and eventually gets in very brief uh, kind of frantic contact with uh, Greg and and mentions everything from occult marines, some sort of the uh, marines doing occult rituals to uh, some sort of non-human intelligence that has a uh, telekinetic of effect over other human beings and things like that. And these are the two hardest parts to tie down They're the two most suspicious parts of the narrative and greg and dana fully realize that um but are brave enough to chase the leads nevertheless it makes me think that if someone's making this all up or leading them that these two characters or stories were created 
to kind of be anchors to think that there were actually people they could find um, like this Amy character who has a brief Skype session with Greg to to really tie down what's going on here. Um, and, and she describes being hunted and seems very paranoid in her own way and has said she's uh, framed with the methamphetamines and her house is broken into and everything. And then they, they never really get full contact with her. Um, like I'm saying, I just think those are the parts that were either strewn out for them to... to sort of sniff after to give the rest of us some sort of narrative um, to come out through the documentary, or there were actual people who were contacting them separately and interacting with this phenomenon and really wanted somebody with a little more expertise to, uh, to explain it, to, to investigate it further. Um, so I mentioned the Marine occult connection. There's this, Order of St. John and Nord Davis, and I'm not going to pretend I know any of this stuff. Why don't you explain uh, the link between odd bishops and these sorts of rituals and phenomena? Yeah, well, this was one of the most, uh, you know, striking aspects of this to me, and it was what really had kind of made me, you know, sit up proverbially and start taking this very seriously, because uh, I've definitely had a strong suspicion at various points that uh, the whole Hellier thing is a hoax, or at the minimum it was started as a hoax, but... Um, it certainly seems that even if that was the case, it has taken on a life of its own as it, uh, you know, has kind of continued to grow. And uh, it kind of reminds me really a bit of, um, I think it was the UMO phenomena, U-M-M-O, uh, which was kind of a, a UFO flap that broke out in Spain in the 1960s. And uh, it seems quite evident that it was started as a hoax, but um, there's been a lot of strange things that have come up in relation to it that uh, UFOologists like Jacques Vallée and what have you have chronicled over the years. And it seems like something really similar has started to happen with Hellyer. And what it really, uh, you know, really, really convinced me that there was something to this was um, a section in the second season where they're interviewing this uh, individual who claimed that he had met Terry Wrist, I believe, at some point in the early 90s. This isn't uh, Greenfield. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. I think it was something like Calvin or something like that. But um, anywho, so he sits down and he does an interview with Greg and uh, he essentially tells them that he had met Terry Wrist at a compound in the early 90s. Uh, I believe in Georgia, that uh, had been set up by a guy named Nord Davis. And, you know, this was really perplexing to me because I knew that I had uh, heard of the name Davis before, but I couldn't place it. And a uh, bit of a brief search found that Davis was a big figure within uh, the Christian identity movement, which is uh, quite an appalling ideology. It's essentially a kind of almost white supremacist Gnosticism or something to that effect, where <laughs> essentially uh, the actual Jews of the Bible were white Aryans who had immigrated to Europe and had set up the various European countries there. And uh, i.e. Denmark is the tribe of Dan and that type of thing. And the actual Jews were essentially demonic beings and so forth. And uh, yeah, it, it's quite a toxic ideology. And in the United States, it's been linked to just legions of instances of terrorism over the years. I mean, probably the most notorious was the Oklahoma City bombings. Uh, Timothy McVeigh, it's never really been proven if he was an adherent of the ideology himself, but he had spent time at one of the compounds, Elohim City, that was uh, definitely in this camp. Uh, there were a lot of other figures over the years, Israeli Keys, the serial killer, J.B. Stoner, uh, an attorney in Atlanta who had been linked to numerous bombings of African-American churches in the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, I really would like to emphasize this was a very, very militant movement. A lot of these people were responsible for, you know, enormous tragedies. Uh, you know, it was a very serious thing, and there seems to have been ties to this with um, the U.S. intelligence community and the military on some level, which I'll get to in a second. But um, getting back to Nord Davis for a minute, Davis was involved in an organization uh, in the late 1980s known as the Civilian Material Assistance. And uh, this group was actually involved with supplying arms to the Contras in Nicaragua during the 1980s. And this was, of course, you know, during the whole Iran-Contra era. The CMA was tied into all of this. And the CMA also had ties to 
a Tennessee-based branch of the Sovereign Order of St. John, which you had just mentioned. Uh, the SOSJ had been founded in the 1950s. Well, it claimed to have descent going back to the uh, Knights Hospitar and, you know, all that stuff through the Russian line of descent after the Knights of Malta had been briefly suppressed in the early 19th century. It's all quite combobulated and there's not a lot of credibility to it so i'm not going to get too deeply into that but i have had some things on my blog if you're interested in checking out the deeper history of this but anyway in the 1950s uh the modern sosj emerges in shikshini pennsylvania which has led to the group sometimes being referred to as the shikshini knights of malta they're headed by a guy named charles pitchell who had potentially worked with Nazi intelligence during the Second World War. He also appears to have been involved in bootlegging, possibly drug trafficking. So kind of an all-around great guy. Um, somehow, inexplicably, he sets up this group and he's able to attract a lot of very senior, high-ranking military men, quite a few generals, quite a few admirals, and so forth. Uh, one of the most notorious was probably General Charles Willoughby, who had effectively been Douglas MacArthur's chief of intelligence uh, throughout the Second World War and going into Korea. And uh, quite a few of the other officers had also had ties to MacArthur for that matter as well. And, you know, that in and of itself was very interesting. MacArthur, of course, there's been kind of a, a cult of personality surrounding MacArthur in the far right for years now. With George Lincoln Rockwell, George uh, Gerald L. K. Smith, and of course, even more recently, Trump himself. And beyond that, though, MacArthur has also been kind of embraced by uh, the UFOologists and that type of thing as well. There's been speculation that MacArthur might have been an insider and aware of that. Of course, in 1962, he made a very curious speech to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and um, for our purposes here. Uh, this was one of the more relevant passages of that speech, and it goes, uh, We deal now not with things of this world alone, but with the illimitable distances as yet unfathomable mysteries of the universe. We are reaching out for a new and boundless frontier. We speak in strange terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of making winds and tides work for us, of creating unheard of synthetic materials to supplement or even replace our old standard basics, to purify seawater for our drink, of mining ocean floors for new fields of wealth and food, of disease preventiveness to expand life into hundreds of years, of controlling the weather for a more equitable distribution of heat and cold, of rain and shine, of spaceships to the moon, of the primary target in the war no longer limited to armed forces of an enemy, but instead to include civil populaces, of ultimate conflict between a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. So, yeah, there's a lot of very curious things that MacArthur had alluded to in this speech, and uh, I would imagine that quite a few of the generals and admirals affiliated with the SOSJ had taken some of these points to heart uh, long before uh, MacArthur had even made this speech in 62. As far as the SOSJ goes, it had had a very keen interest in UFOs and, you know, human potential and a lot of this kind of stuff going back to the early 1960s of course the founder charles pitchell had established what he dubbed uh the international authority for terrestrial operation of galactic powers task force <laughs> he had begun obsessed with alternative medicine and uh the same cosmic energy supposedly that MacArthur had alluded to in his 1962 speech and baxter or excuse me pitchell was not alone in this there were some other figures who would turn up quite significantly in the UAA at the new age and the UFO communities over the years. Uh, one of them was Cleve Baxter, who was the group's alleged uh, interrogation specialist, quote unquote. Baxter had worked with the counterintelligence corps and the CIA. Uh, he was something of a polygraph guru and he would later be credited, I guess, with uh, devising a way that you could communicate with plants uh, allegedly with polygraph this had eventually inspired the book the secret life of plants baxter was also extremely well placed in uh the ufo and new age circles i mean he was in contact with a host of people arthur young andrea puharic l ron hubbard ingo swan travis walton the famous ufo abductee uh so baxter was extremely well placed but for our purposes here an even more interesting name was uh, colonel philip j corso 
who would go on to write The Day After Roswell, which was published, I think, in 97. And of course, The Day After Roswell has really, you know, done a tremendous amount to shape the whole mythos surrounding the Roswell crash for just years now. So, you know, this, despite the really far right politics of this group and its ties to Christian identity and whatnot, the SOSJ did have a very keen interest in UFOs and likely other types of occultism as well. And that kind of brings up the second point here, uh, which is quite interesting. And that is its ties to the American Orthodox Catholic Church. And uh, for those of you unaware, this was the same church that uh, Peter Lavendia had been involved in in the late 1960s and I believe the early 1970s. Of course, Lavendia is the famed cult researcher who wrote The Unholy Alliance and uh, the Sinister Forces books and what have you, some of the most scholarly accounts of a lot of this type of stuff. And um, amusingly or not, uh, the first Sinister Forces book was actually one of the first accounts of all of the high weirdness affiliated with Ashland, Kentucky, which um, Greg and company did an investigation at in the second season of Hellier. Of course, Charles Manson had lived in Ashland for a while. There was quite a significant Adena ritual site slash, you know, mound complex in uh, Ashland. So, you know, it's a very to me quite interesting that Lavendia has uh, the first one to really kind of explore this topic, which was later taken up by Greg and Hellier season two. So anyway, Lavendia is a member of the American Orthodox Catholic Church. Uh, he's also probably the writer of the Simon Necronomicon, which uh, again, there's a lot of weird speculation concerning the Simicon and what have you. Uh, one of the guys he's involved with in the American Orthodox Catholic Church had ties <clears throat> as well to the SOSJ. He was a guy named uh, Saint, quote unquote, Christopher Maria Stanley. Uh, Stanley was a priest in the American Orthodox Catholic Church. He had become involved with Pitchell's group at some point in the late 1950s. He theoretically broke with them, but just how decisive the break was was debatable. If you've really looked into a lot of these far right circles, they tend to go to great lengths to ridicule each other in public and then kind of stealthily work with each other behind closed doors, so to speak. So I'm definitely very uh, dubious as to how thorough the break was. But anyway, Stanley had been based in New York City. He up and decided to relocate around the early 1960s with his own version of the Sovereign Order of St. John, and he relocates to Louisville, Kentucky which is about uh, two hours from Hellier and uh, Somerset, which is the uh, the town in Kentucky that really plays a major role in the second season. So by at least the early 1960s, you've got this strange Order of St. John active in Kentucky, and there are certainly indications that they were involved in some very nefarious occult activities. And I say that because of one of the individuals specifically that Carl Maria Stanley had ordained as a priest and that was David Ferry. David Ferry is a big figure in JFK assassination research circles. Um, to put this kind of in perspective, for those of you out there who don't follow these types of things, uh, he was played by Joe Pesci in Oliver Stone's excellent uh, film, JFK. Uh, Ferry was close to Oswald at some point when they were uh, both active in Louisiana. He worked for Guy uh, Bannister, the private detective that Oswald had also been kind of running odd jobs for and whatnot. David Ferry was also kind of plugged into this whole, you know, militia circle and this type of thing as well. And uh, quite ominously, David Ferry was also um, an arch child rapist. Uh, he was actually accused of molesting dozens of boys in the New Orleans area and uh, seems like at one point several of the anti-Castro Cubans that he was working to arm up and train for a reconquest of Cuba had actually been sent around New Orleans to intimidate some of the uh, victims of his sexual assaults and so forth and um, there are also a lot of accusations that Ferry was involved in occult rituals and so forth, uh, along with Clay Shaw, another figure who's quite prominent in JFK assassination circles. So, you know, you have with the Sovereign Order of St. John, this whole just network largely comprised of former military men that seem to have been, on the one hand, actively managing this, you know, underground Christian identity network that had been used for numerous acts of terrorism in the United States for many years now. I've gone in more to the connections between the SOSJ and uh, Christian identity on my website, but the big 
point of contact is a guy named Colonel William Potter Gale. Gale had served under uh, SOSJ member Charles Willoughby in the Second World War. He was a military intelligence officer like Willoughby. And uh, Gale, uh, he had been uh, interviewed by a journalist, uh, Seymour, uh, in the 1980s. And she asked him point blank, you know, where did you get the ideal to start spreading Christian identity theology? And he told her in uh, 1959, I think, he was approached by three senior military officers. Uh, one of them was uh, General Pedro Del Valle, and the other one was a Colonel Benjamin Stahl. And both of these guys were members of the SOSJ, and they were effectively the ones who had told him or instructed him, rather, to start spreading the identity theology and crafting these, you know, militia groups and so forth. So... Yeah, I mean, the SOSJ, on the one hand, seems to have been active in you know, creating this network of kind of right-wing terrorists. And then on the flip side of the coin, it has these bizarre ties to the UFO community and the New Age community through guys like Corzo and Baxter. And then on the same token, uh, it also has ties to this even stranger church that Peter Lavendia was involved in, the American Orthodox Catholic Church. And there is one member, both of them, Carl Maria Stanley, who was active in Kentucky in the 1960s, who set up branches of the SOSJ there. And then, you know, all of these years later, you have this whole flap with Hellier that's unfolding, uh, that's centered in Kentucky, where this Amy girl is talking about these, you know, occult military men running dark projects there and so on and so forth. And the kind of looming specter of Nord Davis and Terry Wrist. Nord Davis, as I had kind of gotten to uh, at the beginning of this long spiel, was, you know, a guy who was involved with uh, members of the SOSJ and the civil military material assistance thing. So it's just it, to me, it's really incredible. And, you know, this was not something at all I had really been planning on you know, turning up when I was looking at Hellier. And it was only really the offhand reference to Nord Davis that it got me kind of thinking about all of this and then starting to put the pieces together. And, um, you know, for those of you who have followed my website for a lot of years now, you know that I'm quite obsessed with the Sovereign Order of St. John. I've, you know, spent years chronicling them, and I've really only published a small fraction of my research. Uh, my research assistant and I have actually been compiling documents on the SOSJ for years now through the, you know, private collections of guys like Pedro Del Valle and whatnot. So, yeah, when I saw that and the possibility that there were connections there, it just totally blew my mind because this is something that I've been looking into for years. And if, in fact, Terry Rist was involved with uh, Nord Davis, and this is something I'm very much hoping to get confirmation from with Greenfield and uh, the show next week, I mean, that would be really, I think, quite significant. And uh, really, it would, you know, it really paints a quite an ominous picture on, you know, this whole phenomenon that they're uncovering in Hellier and potentially the ties to these just strange right-wing occult circles that have kind of loomed as a specter behind the new age and the ufo communities now since at least the 1950s surely uh just a few notes on what you said uh if you guys are interested in finding uh joe pesci and david ferry in the same place again check out martin scorsese's last uh, rather acclaimed film the irishman where robert de niro uh comes across david ferry uh and he looks as odd as he's always been described the wandering bishops and these strange religious men who have secret occult knowledge is something that comes up in Greenfeld's books, and he speaks of these wandering bishop types being the only ones with the the type of knowledge to really decode and understand the way the book of the law is being used, the codex within the book of the law is being uh, used in this context. And if you guys are just interested in the idea of the wandering bishops and you want to know more about half the people that Stephen just named, um, Peter Lavenda's secret space lecture uh, a few years back, I believe it was in Amsterdam, but if you just YouTube, Peter Lavenda, and you see him behind a podium in a secret space program, that's going to be the one. It's about an hour and a half, and it, it gets deeply into all these men's backgrounds. And even some of the men that Stephen named, articulating further how not only do they have bizarre religious and military connections, but were also integral to the sort of pop culture history of ufology and um and events that made the newspaper at the time and and got law enforcement or the military involved um so in what way is 
Somerset, um, or if you just want to talk <clears throat> in general about the Midwest and U.S. in the U.S., in what way is that kind of mirrored in the U.K.? We know that both both of these places have these bizarre underground beings and these specific geographical places of contact. Would you like to talk any about Somerset, either one of them? <laughs> Well, yeah, sure. I mean, of course, um, in the UK, of course, there's a county there that's called uh, Somerset, formerly Somerset Shire, and uh, it's quite famous in new uh, aid circles and so forth as well. And that's probably due to the presence of the Glastonbury Abbey there uh, and Glastonbury Tor, I believe, which is kind of a mound type structure that they've got there. And some of the Arthurian myths, it was the actual location of Avalon there. So it definitely seems like the Somerset in the UK is another sort of hot spot for this, you know, kind of strange occult phenomenon and so forth, such as what we're kind of seeing depicted in Somerset, Kentucky and the Hellier show. And, you know, just to kind of, you know, give the listeners another instance of just bizarre synchronicities. Um, so we had had a couple of uh, interviews in the can uh that we were just able to publish a few days ago, uh, one of which was on Doctor Who. And uh, there was actually a woman who had contacted us uh, from that episode who uh, essentially had told me a very strange story about her own experiences in Somerset, in the uh, Somerset, UK, I should say, uh, that tied into a kind of mind control program that she believed was being carried out there. So, uh, yeah, it's just... And this was totally unsolicited, and it was only something after the fact. I was just like, "Oh wow, wait a minute, that's that that was in Somerset," and uh, you know, kind of on that oh, you know whole thread as well. Next week, when we have Alan in the, you know, in here with us discussing this type of stuff, we're also going to be joined by Paul Weston, who is himself based out of Somerset, and uh, you know, does the whole tour of the Glastonbury region and so forth. So it's just you know incredible how you know, even without looking for this kind of stuff, it just kind of seems like that you continue to stumble over them and what have you, uh, just from having watched the hell your show. So yeah, it's, it's really quite incredible. And certainly that will probably lead to some more interesting threads uh, with Somerset UK in contrast to the Somerset Kentucky when we get into this in the next episode. Um, and that's the exact advice that Greenfeld gives the crew that, that, entering upon this possible uh magical working that i think he actually uses the same terms you just did will wind up stumbling over things personally things that'll just wind up in our path as they did with the uh the hellier crew and i, I never saw it becoming this personal this quickly it's deeply interesting i'm sorry what were you saying oh yeah you know that's fine but yeah i mean absolutely and it just you know it seems like just a lot of uh, you know information that I've stumbled upon threads that some of my readers have passed on to me and what have you have kind of inadvertently become linked in my mind to the whole thing with Hellier. And, um, yeah, I mean, it just is really amazing how these connections seem to keep, uh, cropping up. And, you know, another one that I thought was kind of interesting that I had meant to get into earlier, uh, before we had gotten away from it, but the whole issue with ley lines or, you know, dragon lines or whatever you want to call them and why exactly they seem to connect uh, or why they seem to enhance, you know, certain paranormal experiences and whatnot. Well, as I was kind of talking about earlier, I think a lot of this stuff is, you know, psychic in nature and so forth. Uh, again, with the ritual sites, with the Adena and so forth, it was a kind of descent into the underworld, but I think that the caves and so forth were mainly meant to induce a kind of sensory deprivation to make the mind freer so that it could get into these, you know, other currents that potentially would put it in contact with, you know, let's say a non-human intelligence or something to that effect. And how ley lines play into this, I think it might be related to uh, telluric currents, essentially, or earth currents. These are electric currents that move through the underground of the earth and the sea. And they can be caused by natural causes, sometimes by humans. But um, what's really interesting about that is these currents are uh, extreme low frequency waves, essentially elf waves. And um, again, for those of you who have sort of followed some of these, you know, accounts of potential with mind control and whatnot, uh, no less an authority than Adrena Puhari could actually become quite obsessed with elf waves and their ability to alter human consciousness and so forth. So... And this also kind of goes into Hellier with these reports that uh, 
some of the participants have at times when they're at sites that they've been directed to, they start hearing a kind of hum or something like that coming from the ground. Mm -hmm. And it does make me think, you know, was this kind of a manifestation of these extreme low frequency currents or, you know, these telluric currents and so forth? And is this something that's helping to increase the psychic phenomenon at certain sites and why it does seem like that there are certain sites that are more predisposed to these paranormal phenomena and things of that nature. I mean, it does seem to me quite evident that the mind is a key component of all of this and how it interacts with the surrounding environment. And certainly if this is accurate, if there are certain sites in the earth where these telluric currents are stronger than other ones, that could certainly explain why on the one hand, it seems that there are increased uh, psychic abilities there. On the other hand, why this makes people more susceptible to paranormal or occult uh, experiences. And we also know that ELF waves decades ago were weaponized and are a integral part of the psychotronic weaponry arsenal that our military has a sort of... Um, yeah, I forgot the original term, but it was like non-threatening non, or non non-lethal weapons. And I go. should yeah, I should say though that should be taken with a grain of salt because uh uh I've had some people tell me, let's just say that Puharic was really the guy who had promoted this. And yeah, I've had some people with a much firmer scientific background than myself tell me that a lot of what Puharic was talking about in this regard was BS. Uh it could possibly be done, but not in the fashion that's been released to the general public and certainly Puharic and I think the other guy was Thomas Braden or something like that was the guy who had really promoted a lot of this. I think a lot of that type of stuff was disinformation, but like a lot of great dis disinformation potentially with a basis in reality. Surely. I know that John Alexander and Aquino uh, were certainly excited about the ideas and bring them up a lot, but they're also responsible for um, the the origins and the whole basis of psychological warfare so it could easily be part of disinformation, which, as you say, is always flavored with real facts so as to be as confusing and, and convoluted as possible. And of um, course, you know, this is something we've talked about a lot, but again, it probably bears repeating here. Aquino and uh, Alexander are both involved in the Association of Former Intelligence Officers uh, in the Las Vegas chapter with Peter Lavendia, the uh, guy just talking about here with the American uh, Orthodox Catholic Church. So, yeah, I mean, all of this is really just remarkably incestuous, to put it mildly. And by the way, in the past few years, uh, Lavenda has joined Tom DeLong's TTSA UFO effort supposedly working hand in hand with the DOD or Pentagon or some such on the the truth of UFOs and then um John wait did I I'm sorry that's Peter Lavenda and then John Alexander has put out a book on UFOs and metaphysics to influence that field in in whatever way he sees fit these days but I just wanted to add uh, one other note. We were talking about the number 17, and um, it would be wrong to not mention if you guys are interested in the 17 connections, particularly ones we didn't even bring up in, in today's show about uh, NASA and launches of different shuttles and mysterious conspiracies within our space program. Uh, check out The Secret Sun because Knowles has um, done multi-part series just on the connections between 17 and, and those sort of air and space events yeah, um the, uh, one of the yeah. best one is the edge of 17 actually i think that was the name of the post um yeah that was actually you know ironically that was one of the things that really made me fall in love with the secret son in the first place and become obsessed with Knowles's writing was the fact that he had gotten into the number 17 and uh like i said for me it's just uh, you know on a personal level whenever i see 17s i usually attach a lot of significance to it for a variety of reasons and um Certainly over the course of my life, I mean, that's borne fruit, uh, for better or worse. Uh, definitely a lot of strange things related to 17 that have happened to me over the years. And, you know, one of the things was certainly discovering the secret son. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he goes way off on this whole uh, conspiracy about one of the astronauts being obama's real father who was on the challenger and things like that i'm not going to try to break that down here but check out the secret sun if you guys are interested um all right i think we're gonna wrap this one up unless steven you had anything uh you wanted to add to the 
Uh, no, I think that's good for now, but um, certainly, you know, make sure you guys check us out next week. Uh, I think next week's show is going to be quite epic and certainly looking forward to have a chance to kind of uh, pick Greenfield's brain a little bit. Absolutely. It's very exciting to have uh, Greenfield and Paul Wesson in the same place and be able to talk about Hellier. Uh, I interviewed Greenfield in the past, and you guys can check that out on the Zero Night blog, where I go into a lot of this stuff, but hellier had not come out yet um and we'll be we'll be tackling a lot of these ideas sort of unpacking these ideas in the next couple of shows because hellier is so dense and so very interesting uh it'd be foolish to try to cover it in one or two shows or interviews but okay thanks everybody for uh joining us and uh see you next week